What Next TBD is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Vijay Vaithiswaran. I'm the Global Energy and Climate Innovation Editor at The Economist. How many COPs do you think you've covered at this point? Uh, too many is the answer. Um, <laughs> there's, no, there's no good number to cover. COP stands for Conference of the Parties. It's the UN's annual summit on climate change. This year's COP in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, is the 27th one. The most memorable one probably was uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, a couple of decades ago when I was standing near Frank Loy, the U.S. negotiator who had a pie thrown in his face. And I can still taste the custard. Vijay argues that not all cops are created equal. There are big ones and there are little ones. So every five years or so there is a big cop, meaning there's something quite substantial on the agenda, a uh, major breakthrough. We can think about the Paris Accord, which was uh, reached, of course, in France. Uh, that was a big cop. There was a lot that people had to negotiate for. And then a number of years went by, and then we had the Glasgow COP. Now, it was a little more than five years because of the pandemic. But that's the rhythm of these UN conferences of the parties. Vijay says that this year's COP, COP27, is a little COP. But that doesn't mean that uh, nothing uh, is going to happen. And there is one very explosive issue, which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is reparations. Climate reparations, what the UN calls loss and damage— That would mean rich countries, big emitters like the United States, would pay developing nations for the damage they've suffered from climate change. Damage they did very little to create. Today on the show, poor countries want to see the money. Vijay says it isn't going to happen and that asking for reparations is the wrong approach. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Have you ever hit a technical snafu while shopping online? Has filling out payment fields given you a headache? Has a mobile banking app ever been down when you wanted to use it? Capital One believes everyone deserves better banking. This means easier access to money and more security. That's why Capital One is investing in machine learning. With machine learning, Capital One can fight fraud faster, improve mobile app experiences, and make online shopping more efficient. Models can quickly detect suspicious activity and alert federal investigators faster. They can also identify how mobile app outages happen through anomaly detection and incident response, so engineers can remedy them quickly. And machine learning also helps Capital One speed up online shopping by making it easier and more secure to use virtual card numbers. The potential of machine learning is so big. See how Capital One is using machine learning to create the future of banking. Search machine learning at Capital One. Capital One, what's in your wallet? President El Sisi, thank you very much for this wonderful hospitality. Apart from your standard diplomatic platitudes, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was not subtle in his opening remarks at COP27. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. But climate hell looks different depending where you are on the globe. And going in, everyone pretty much knew what would be on this year's agenda. If you just look at it from the point of view of, you know, uh, what's realistically achievable. There was a chance that at this particular gathering, we would see 
the issue of loss and damage, that's UN speak for money that uh, would be paid from rich countries, particularly to the most vulnerable poor countries, uh, in recognition of the fact that rich countries got rich burning fossil fuels by and large uh, and contributed the most to the problem, and that mostly vulnerable countries, especially the island states and some of the very poorest countries are the ones that are going to suffer the worst damage starting very, very soon, and therefore should be compensated, right? That issue had been fought for a very long time by the rich countries, especially the United States, yeah. that didn't want to acknowledge it uh, because they were worried about liability, lawsuits. And there was some hope that this might be discussed formally on the agenda, and that's what's happening this time. The idea of loss and damage, or climate reparations, isn't new. The Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu raised the question of who should pay for damage to their archipelago back in the 1990s. But what's novel, Vijay says, is rich countries allowing discussion of the issue into the carefully choreographed linguistic dance of international negotiations. On the first day of COP, uh, just as it was starting, there was actually a surprise that the, uh, particularly the advanced economies, notably the United States, allowed loss and damage to be formally written into the agenda for discussion, right? Because they'd had, they had obstructed it. That terminology, especially because it was loaded uh, with the concept of reparations mm. possibly coming through, was one that was blocked historically by um, Western governments. And this time, it's on there as a point of discussion. Now, that doesn't mean there's going to be any money. That doesn't mean there's going to be any resolution of it at this COP. But now it's officially part of the process. And so that's something. And uh, it, at least it's uh, you can think of it as a, you know, the sort of the thin end of the wedge on this issue. Yeah, I, I am fascinated by the, for lack of a better term, glacial pace by which some of this moves. I mean, loss and damage was talked about in Warsaw in 2013 and again in Madrid in 2019. And yet it seemed like this was was the big one of sort of having the United States and the EU at least be willing to maybe discuss this. The idea that rich countries should acknowledge uh, that there was a uh, historic contribution to emissions, that poor countries will suffer the brunt of this, and that rich countries should help pay for uh, dealing with these consequences, right? Uh, that that idea has been around for decades. It's yeah. uh, and, and in the UN uh, discussions has been around, but it has always been resisted in part because um, uh, there are several questions, right? Uh, some of them related to liability. That is, if uh, particularly the United States acknowledges some sort of culpability, liability, then the lawsuits would never end. We're a litigious society. We already know there are climate lawsuits that are underway and attempts at climate lawsuits around the world. And so there was a great reluctance from uh, American administrations of both stripes, not only one uh, or the other, but uh, really all American administrations have been resistant to that idea for that reason. John Kerry, the U.S. climate envoy to these talks, dug in his heels when asked about it at the conference. But it's a well-known fact that the United States and many other countries uh, will not uh, establish some sort of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of a legal structure that is uh, uh, tied to, uh, you know, uh, compensation or liability. We're, that's just not happening. Uh, but there are also other questions raised about what exactly would be the structure of any fund that's created, right? How much money would it be enough and how would it be spent? If it's just an enormous kitty with lots of money that the UN administers, questions come up about transparency, about corruption, about efficiency. Is this the right way to deal with the problem, right? So it's not just a question of uh, not wanting to say sorry or not wanting to cough up the money. There are other ways of dealing with this as well through existing multilateral institutions, through bilateral donor aid. I mean, the rich world, especially the U.S., but certainly European allies in Japan, already give lots of money for uh, funding disaster relief for the WHO, which deals with health emergencies, which will increasingly be related to climate emergencies, for refugee flows through the U.N. again. And so there are already mechanisms in place. What would a giant new U.N. fund do that would be really good? Uh, if it were done well, that'd be fantastic. But a lot of people have doubts about the UN. Can it really administer a massive fund in a non-corrupt way uh, is one of the questions that people ask. Vijay says he's not skeptical of the moral case for loss and damage, but he questions whether it's at all practical. I don't think we're going to find a lot of uh, support for a massive loss and damage fund. I certainly agree at this COP. I mean, that's not going to happen, not at this 
gathering. Um, I think at best what might happen is some agreement to have a, a, a discussions continued at another UN forum going forward. Um, that is the, you know, this process will wind down for a year or two where we continue to talk about talking about talking about talking about maybe ultimately setting up a fund that has maybe some unknown amount of money. That's sort of how these things work, right? It's a slow walk. I think that's sort of what's going on here. But let's even game it out and say, okay, let's get to the end of that movie. There is a fund. It's set up. Developing countries get what they want. How much money would there be? And the answer is, it's got to be measured in billions, right? That's really what we're talking about uh, is realistic, if if anything will go in there at all. But the scale of dealing with climate change is a problem that has to be measured in trillions of dollars, not billions, right? And so that's why, that's where my skepticism comes from, that this UN-administered process of getting apologies from the rich countries and a bunch of money will anyway be commiserate to the actual task, which is immediate humanitarian tragedies happening on a daily and weekly and monthly basis going forward. And we need rapid disbursement of aid. We need much more money to deal with that humanitarian crisis response, including probably nimbler ways of getting money, bypassing government bureaucracies through micropayments, for example, um, and directly to people in affected communities uh, and engaging them with sort of questions and and, uh, participation in what they need to rebuild their communities. That's very different than what the UN is good at. I would like to take a concrete example and sort of puzzle out with you how this stuff works. So let's let's take Pakistan. It it came to this COP really pushing for the idea of a fund. It contributes less than one percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, but it's hugely vulnerable to climate change, as we have sort of horrifyingly seen this year. Where could Pakistan get the money to help, and and how do you think that could work in I guess, the most constructive way? So I would reframe the question, if you don't mind, and I would say, what is the best way for countries like Pakistan to deal with the ongoing and increasing uh, risk of these sorts of emergencies, right, that are caused by or at a minimum exacerbated by climate change? Let's remember, disasters are a normal uh, and, and horrible reality for the developing world and have been through all of time, right? Before uh, the Industrial Revolution began, there were disasters in the developing world. And so uh, climate change makes worse things that were already happening, in addition to creating entirely new perils. And so countries need capacity. They need capacity, they need resilience, they need decent policies, they need fairly honest administration of resources. Those are the fertile soils on which seeds need to fall. If you simply pour a bunch of money into a system that doesn't work, a a corrupt cronyistic state, let's say, or one that has very little uh, community outreach, local adaptation capability, then you're not going to have the effect that you want. Uh, You might side off, say, yes, we're sorry, here's a bunch of money. But the people who are affected may not get those resources in the way they need them to adapt. Right. But but people should not be punished for the the ineptitude or the corruption of their government. So... How then does an international community create those opportunities for resilience, for change that are, you know, accountable or transparent? Uh, You're right. People should not be punished for the incompetence or venality of their governments, but this is a regular occurrence throughout the world, right? Uh, This is the state of how things are. So in an imperfect world, how do we move forward? One way is to think about the UN process. And there are things that the UN does very well. UNICEF, for example, is a, is an excellent organization. Vaccinations, for example, uh, is, is an example where we see a phenomenal interventions by an official body, an or- organized UN approach, where we're very, very good at vaccinating uh, poor children in the developing world, right? That's something that works. And can we maybe learn from that, cut and paste in other areas of disaster relief? But there's also a huge amount of philanthropic uh, intervention. You see, in, at this COP, uh, the, the Gates Foundation announced a huge $1.4 billion for adaptation funding. It's one of the biggest contributions to that area. And again, adaptation is very close to uh, loss and damage. Now, technically, it's a different bucket, right? Uh, yeah, can you translate some, some UN into English for me? So mitigation and adaptation are the, are the phrases that get thrown around in normal person speak. What is that? Stop emitting greenhouse gases that, you know, reducing uh, the amount of coal we burn and just generally dealing with the uh, causing the problem in the first place. That's called mitigation in UN speak, right? The meaning, how do we uh, transition 
to a clean energy economy, for example, or deal with methane emissions from rice paddies uh, and flatulent cows and that sort of thing, right? So dealing with emissions in the first place that cause the problem uh, is mitigation. Now, adaptation is the next bucket, which used to be seen as sort of a dirty word by some in the activist community, because if you say, well, if you're going to invest in adaptation, you've already given up. You know, you're not going to mm. try to shut down big oil. You're saying just live with the consequences of climate change. Well, those days are gone now, right? We are already in a world of, of severe climate impacts. And unfortunately, because of that ideological opposition to dealing with adaptation, we lost a couple of decades, in my view. Vijay argues that developed economies can help vulnerable countries now by spending money on adapting to climate change, following the lead of a number of philanthropies. The Gates Foundation as well has announced money, in addition to the Rockefeller and other philanthropic organizations are spending a lot on helping smallholder farmers, for example, in Africa. Um, they, they face a double bind. There's going to be droughts. That's going to mean their crops are going to be uh, need to be drought resistant. But at the same time, they're also going to have freakish storms. And so they're going to have prolonged periods of excess water. Now, how do you develop strains uh, of the kinds of crops that they use, cassava and others in, in sub-Saharan Africa, that are uh, able to handle both kinds of stress, right? That's the kind of challenge that uh, these foundations are putting money into with the UN system of agricultural research that helped develop the first green revolution, uh, which really saved a billion lives uh, five decades ago, that system of agricultural research stations is getting funding from philanthropy as well as through the UN. Those are the kinds of things that may be unglamorous, they're kind of in the weeds and bottom up, but that actually make a difference. And that's, I think, where there is progress away from the headlines and away from the rancor of some of the politics of the UN process. We're actually seeing more and we need to double down and quadruple down on those kinds of investments on the ground, building capacity, right? It's when you build that capacity, it actually helps the local governments in those areas, whatever the national politics, um, they can see the benefits in the community. When we come back, is ignoring poor countries' requests for reparations a kind of climate colonialism? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to write anything from a book or screenplay to just a letter. Improve your communication skills with your boss or your family. You can learn how to make a dinner worthy of a Michelin star, or just how to make really good scrambled eggs. With over 150 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Explore lessons in any order you'd like, across your phone, tablet, Apple TV, computer, and on the go with audio mode. Lessons of approximately 10 to 15 minutes in length fit easily into your everyday life. In addition to video lessons, Masterclass provides you with downloadable lesson recaps and supplemental materials. For example, cooking classes come with beautiful downloadable guides that are at the level of a high-end cookbook. Get unlimited access to every class, and as a What Next TBD listener, you get 15% off on an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash TBD now. That's masterclass.com slash TBD for 15% off Masterclass. When should we go into the office? How do you network when you're working remotely? On Work Lab, the podcast from Microsoft, we explore how work is changing. It's hosted by me, Elise Hugh. And me, Tanya Mosley. We talk to leading experts on the future of work. Economists, technologists, researchers, CEOs, psychologists, neuroscientists, authors, behavioral scientists, and more. Follow Work Lab on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Uh, I sort of hear you describing a, a two-track thing where maybe... At the COP, there are the press conferences and the big negotiations and and sort of whatever grabs headlines, and then the unofficial stuff that's that's happening on the sidelines, whether that is, you know, under the umbrella of the UN or under the umbrella of philanthropy. Is that accurate? Absolutely. And and not only those categories, but we see the private sector stepping up as well. We're seeing a number of uh, corporates making commitments, big corporates from around the world are promising to purchase green products before they're economic, right? Um, hmm. uh, for example, green cement was announced as uh, at this year's COP, but previously there have been other categories that have been announced uh, at last year's COP or at uh, you know gatherings like the Davos World Economic Forum, uh, Confab, where these fat cats like to get together. But you know, 
to give them their due, uh, being willing to pay above the odds for the first batch of green cement, let's say cement that's made in a way that's less greenhouse gas intensive, it costs a lot. And you're not going to just pay for it uh, you know, in the marketplace. The market wouldn't justify that kind of premium. But these um, big companies are offering to do pay more for it and thereby bringing in the market. It's like the, the, you know, the rich and green uh, sort of uh, Silicon Valley folks who bought the first Tesla Roadster for $125,000, $150,000. Um, they helped buy down the cost so that ultimately Tesla could be acquired for, you know, much less money, uh, $25,000, yeah. dollars $40,000. And, and so it ultimately bring it down the cost. And that's what typically happens with the uh, uh, sort of the first product. And that's a good thing. Uh, I guess to push you on this a little bit, though, there is something about that that feels, I don't know, almost colonialist. You know, you have a, a number of coalitions of countries from the global south coming to these conferences saying, listen to us, this is the thing we want, and having big countries, rich countries who have historically emitted a lot, say, no, here is this other option. You know, how how do you get past what what feels like a very um, different mindset from from each group? So let's take that up right at the heart of the colonialist. Colonialism is, is a particular word that represents uh, a certain kind of resource extraction. But I, I think the gist of it, what I'm picking up is a, a moral argument, right? That, yeah, that is yeah. a culp- culpability. Um, the rich world got rich burning fossil fuels, and now they're trying to keep us poor or they're not helping us deal with the consequences of that of that legacy greenhouse gases that's in the atmosphere, where, as in the case of Africa, which contributed hardly 3% of the global stock of greenhouse gases, will probably be the continent that suffers the worst impacts from climate, right? There's no more compelling case than that um, uh, for, to support this moral argument. And so I think the moral case is very strong, and that's why the rich world has to contribute much more. My question is, what mechanisms, what are the ways to do this, right? Is a, an enormous facility as they're called, the uh, you know financial fund managed by the U- United Nations, is that the right amount of money? Uh, is that the right mechanism to do this? I think reasonable people can agree on the morality of it and disagree on the mechanisms, uh, questioning the efficacy of such a fund, right? Um, and there's also some challenges that are put forward on the moral case. If um, uh, if we look at Dickensian in England, where there was a huge amount of coal burned, um, should that burning of coal in, in, in England be held as the same amount of moral culpability as the amount of coal that China burned in the last 20 years. Because now we know. First of all, now we know. And also the volume, right? The sheer volume. Uh, you know, back in Dickens' time, we didn't really know. There's no general awareness of, of c- the kind of consequences of climate change that would be caused by burning that coal. And the last 20 years, we have known, I wrote a book 20 years ago, Power to the People, that made this case based on the best science at the time, that we had to act on climate and move to a net zero world. And so all of the coal burning in China, as well as other countries, uh, it clearly has to have a moral uh, tinge to it. And not only that, today, China is the world's largest emitter and its number of coal plants they are currently building and bringing online in the next 10 years, uh, it continues apace, right? They, they, knowingly, they're building and these plants and emitting. Now, where's China at the table on this, right? So developing countries have actually said during this COP, China should be included. It's not just mm. US and Europe. But then they, the politics of the UN are so fractious, they said, oh, by the way, India too. The island states are demanding that India also pays, that India accepts responsibility and India also pays. And guess what? India will never pay. India still thinks itself as a victim on the global stage. That's the card they play on the world stage. And so in a sense, the politics are poisoned by that choice by those uh, developing countries to demand this. That's why I say that this particular format and forum is a talking shop and there's a lot of posturing going on. I'm a practical person. I say, look, the problems are too severe to leave to the talking shop. Let's find a, other ways to dramatically increase the funding. I, I, you know, there may be a small fund set up. That's great. It'll never be enough for the task. So I think there are lots of things we can do that go beyond just setting up a UN facility, which is fine. I have no problem with that, but I just don't, I think that'll be a palliative. I don't think it'll solve the problem. Hmm. I mean, speaking of China, you know, Pakistan owes about 30% of its debt to China. If if they wanted to, they could just give them a big haircut and give them a lot more money for climate change. But I think you and I would probably agree that's not going to happen. I think the question of developing world debt is not just uh, China, of course. The, you know, the, there's a huge problem, an overhang of debt in the developing world. And if new kinds of assistance to help 
the uh, developing countries green, uh, develop their clean energy, is done through debt instruments in a world of high interest rates and a world of inflation that we're entering, possibly a global recession, I think we're going to see a massive debt crisis that's uh, that's exploding. So I think we need to really rethink that paradigm whereby we consider this to be aid, not just we, the eight rich countries, including China in this group now, um, uh, are peddling ever more debt. Even if it's on concessional terms, it's still a millstone around the neck of developing countries, that, especially the poorest, that cannot afford to service it. There was an international climate agreement this week that BJ thinks could be a model for future ones. It's the JETP, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, that came out of the G20 meeting in Indonesia. It's a fund through which Indonesia will get $20 billion, some from rich countries, some from the private sector, to transition away from coal. And so the basic idea is that this amount of funding will basically pay off coal plants to retire early, because otherwise they'd be spewing out vast amounts of greenhouse gases for the next 30, 40 years, and help fund clean energy, replacing that energy from coal. That's the concept. And I think it's a really good concept because if we do nothing, the amount of coal that's going to be burnt in China, India, in Indonesia, and South Africa alone will mean we'll blow past any attempts to keep climate change within even not just the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, which is we're already well beyond that now yeah. on our trajectory, but well beyond the two degree target also, which is will still be very painful uh, but uh, if we go past that, it's going to be a really hellish world that we're going to head towards. Coal is the number one problem at the moment, I think, and in particular in Asian countries, because that's where the coal is. And of course, South Africa as well, as a big polluter, can be in that group. This kind of deal, they call it a Just Energy Transition Partnership, or JETP in the in the jargon. South Africa got a deal like this last year at last year's COP. Uh, it was worth about $8.5 billion. Indonesia is a much bigger polluter and a much harder problem in terms of uh, the coal mafias and the power of coal elites in that country. And so it's really interesting and innovative to try to tackle this problem by bringing in fresh capital, basically to bribe the coal companies and the, the, those you know investors in, the, in, in coal who have a legitimate legal reason to see their assets run a useful life. You say, hey, we're going to pay you more to wind down your dirty business and that way you create room in the marketplace for what will be subsidized clean energy. Uh, I think it's a very interesting experiment. I, I wish it uh, luck. I hope it succeeds. Coming out of this COP, and I guess kind of watching all the various developments, um, as someone who's covered a lot of these, do you feel hopeful or, or yeah, I guess I sort of wonder how you are feeling about what you saw and what you didn't see? If you only look at what the UN is doing, you would bang your head against a wall, right? It's a very, very frustrating process because yeah, you have to get all 200 plus countries to agree and they get, it's impossible to get them all to agree on anything, or it's very difficult anyway, right? And so it's, it's almost set up to fail, the UN process, because of any one country can veto the entire process. And we saw this uh, last year at Glasgow where there was nearly a consensus to phase out coal. That would have been a huge breakthrough. But at the last minute, the delegate from India hmm. put up a veto. And so the group, which was almost ready there to, to phase out coal as an agreement, a yeah, official UN agreed uh, sort of um, uh, uh, language, we're going to phase down coal was the compromise. Now, what the heck does that mean, phase down coal? It, it, it's meaningless, right? It's UN babble for really, uh, uh, with no targets, no timetables, no money, no nothing. So that's the kind of thing that can happen with one country. So the way I look at it is I say, look, you have to look at this um, uh, like we saw the uh, nuclear arms talks between the USSR and the US during the Cold War, or the trade discussions uh, at the GATT, which was the, the precursor to the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Every year, for year after year, decade after decade, negotiators would meet and they'd try to make progress on different issues. And a lot of times they'd go home empty handed. Sometimes the talks would collapse. But every once in a while, when the timing was right, when self-interest aligned, they'd have a breakthrough. And that talking shop kept, you know, in the case of the nuclear talks, they kept us from having a global Armageddon. And we ultimately did reduce the level of danger uh, to the point where we could get to a Cold War that was not a hot war. In the, in the case of GATT, we did create the World Trade Organization and we had a phenomenal 
golden age of globalization for all of its flaws did help lift up probably a couple of billion people out of the direst poverty. And they were the great beneficiaries of globalization. And so there were things that were achieved. But at the same time, any given negotiation like this year's COP could be quite frustrating. It could yet end in tears on Saturday, we'll have to see, or may have just minor breakthroughs. At the same time, the real action happens from the bottom up, on the side, at the periphery, through coalitions of the willing. That's that's where I find my optimism. Do we have time for that as a planet? Well, the planet's going to be fine. It's a question of, does humanity have time, right? And the answer is no, we don't have time. We, we needed to have acted a couple of decades ago when people began to sound the alarm, and we did not, right? We have failed. There's no other way to put it. There's no simpler way to put it. Now, the question is, given the state of the world and the world we live in, how do we mobilize our resources? How do we dramatically increase climate ambition? And at the same time, bring along those that are going to be losers. Look, among the obstructionists are the Middle Eastern oil company, countries, right? The, uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia and, and its ilk and OPEC, who they're going to be last man standing producing oil, right? So they often object behind the scenes and, and play a spoiler's role. Um, they're the developing countries. In this COP in Africa, we had a number of African countries point out the hypocrisy of Europe guzzling the world's natural gas in the form of liquefied natural gas, LNG imports, so they can keep its lights on during its crisis, raising prices for the poor world to get that gas, and stopping African countries from developing their own gas. Europe has objected and, and put up obstacles. Um, and they say, look, you know, you developed and got rich and now you're keeping us from developing using our resources, that's hypocrisy. And so you see, it's a little more complicated than just, well, the plan is clear, why don't we just act on it? Different people have different points of view on what the plan should be. P.J. Vaithyas Warren, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. V.J. Vaithyas Warren is the Global Energy and Climate Innovation Editor at The Economist. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. We are edited by Tori Bosch. Joanne Levine is the executive producer for What Next, and Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family, and we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you are a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Join Slate Plus. If you become a member, you get all your Slate podcasts with no ads. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. This year, let Best Buy be your holiday hype partner. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts, trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. Best Buy has the best assortment of impactful tech gifts, along with fast and free fulfillment options and great deals all season long. Maybe you're looking for an air fryer to help the aspiring foodie in your life unlock new recipes or a new phone or camera for an aspiring filmmaker who's turning their passion into a side gig. Or you might be on the hunt for a new smartwatch to support a friend's wellness journey. No matter what you're looking for, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. 